Welcome to Indus Special. I'm Ajaz Heather. Commercial flights over conflict areas are becoming hazardous. Iran mistakenly shot down a Ukrainian international flight on Wednesday, 8th Jan. The tragedy unfolded during a high military alert in Iran after the United States target killed an Iranian general and Iran linked Iraqi militia commanders. Iran retaliated with a missile attack on two U.S. military bases in Iraq. On 17th July 2014, a Malaysian airline flight MH17 from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur was shot down while flying over restive eastern Ukraine. All 283 passengers and 15 crew were killed. A similar accident could have happened over Pakistani airspace if the situation had not been handled with professional acumen. An Indian spice jet commercial flight from Delhi to Kabul was assigned a wrong code by the Indian civil aviation authorities. The code was picked up by Pakistan Civil Aviation Authority and passed on to Pakistan Air Force. Pakistan Air Force scrambled two F-16s, which rounded up the airplane, got full details of the flight, escorted them out of Pakistani airspace, and peeled off. This happened on September 23 amid heightened tensions between India and Pakistan following India's illegal annexation of occupied Jammu and Kashmir on 5th August. Earlier on 27th February, as the PF strike package launched Operation Swift Retort, the Indian ground air defenses shot down their own MI-17 helicopter. The IAF Court of Inquiry determined multiple procedural failures to discuss aviation safety in the professional manner. Pakistan Civil Aviation and PF handled the spice test confusion. We are joined by Air Chief Marshal Kaleem Saadat, currently the president of Center for Aerospace and Strategic Studies, a four-star officer of Pakistan Air Force, and headed Pakistan Air Force from 2003, March 2003 to March 2006. We are also joined by Mr. Hamid Reza Wolamzadeh, who's a journalist, analyst, a co-founder of Peace Spirit Foundation, and also an activist for the last 13 years who uh, deals uh, in women's and youth issues. Thank you to both panelists. Let me begin with um, Air Chief Marshal Saadat. Uh, thank you for being on the program, sir. Uh, give us a sense of how this works out. So a flight takes off, it is assigned a code, and then that code is picked by various ground air controls throughout its flight. How does this work? Uh, this is a there is a system that uh, every aeroplane is assigned a identification number which is a code and there is a transponder on every aeroplane which when questioned responds to any query somebody asks for identification it automatically replies also uh, for commercial flights there are laid down air corridors which they must follow and they uh, they don't deviate from those and so uh, predictably you know that the flights going from Tehran westwards or northwestwards will follow a certain route so this particular aeroplane was uh, following that route and uh, this uh, rumor that it had turned around uh, was found to be false it was going straight but when the first missile hit and it lost control that is the time it turned uh, around and it appeared on the radar to have uh, made an attempt to turn towards uh, the Tehran International Airport. Okay. So, it, so going by that, uh, give us a sense of uh, what happened. And, you know, I talked about the professional acumen of Pakistan Air Force and our civil aviation. There could have been a tragedy over Pakistan airspace also uh, in relation to the Indian spice jet. But it was handled very professionally. Uh, tell us something about that. You see, uh, the issue is that uh, there are laid down procedures uh, for identifi identifying aeroplanes, whether these are commercial flights, whether they are identified military aeroplanes or even civil aeroplanes, there are set procedures. You uh, question them, you call them out, and if they don't respond, then the aeroplanes are scrambled. The aeroplanes uh, uh, take off, they uh, go and intercept the target and visually they identify uh, this aeroplane. And surely if it's a commercial aeroplane, then you know you understand that there is no uh, danger. But uh, if you recall, after 27th February, the flights uh, astride the Pakistan-India border were stopped because Pakistan suspected 
that uh, military aeroplanes could shadow, fly in the shadow of commercial airlines and could spring a surprise. So for this reason, the Pakistani airspace was closed to all aeroplanes that were entering Pakistan from the east. Uh, the other issue is that normally such kind of a mishap should not happen because uh, what the Iranians say is that uh, they thought that it was a cruise missile. Cruise missile is a very small uh, body and a commercial airliner is a huge body. So the, uh, the uh, radar ping that you get normally uh, is much different. And the cruise missile also does not fly at 8,000 feet where uh, this particular aeroplane was shot down. So uh, the whole truth is still not out. The inquiry, whenever it is completed, we will exactly know what went wrong. But tentatively, I think what went wrong was that there was uh, a misunderstanding or there was a wrong command given or there was uh, the wrong guidelines given as to what is to be done in case there is a threat from the West, from America specifically, uh, against targets laid, uh, within Iran. The other intriguing part is that this aeroplane was flying away from Tehran. It was not intruding into Iran. And it was apparently going along a fixed corridor where other hundreds of flights every day perhaps follow that route. So it is quite, uh, you know, to, incomprehensible to me how this aeroplane could be shot down uh, on the flight path that it was following. Okay, sir, I will come back to this uh, and you also with reference to uh, how the Indians shot down their own MI-17. But let me hop over to Mr. Ghulam Zadeh here. Mr. Ghulam Zadeh, now the reports are like two things. One, it took Iran about three days to finally concede that it had mistakenly shot down uh, this airliner. Now, uh, subsequently, according to reports, several people have been arrested over the downing of this passenger plane. And President Hassan Rouhani has warned that those responsible would be punished. Uh, Ghulam Hussain Ismaili, uh, the spokesman for Iran's judiciary, uh, was also quoted uh, by saying, uh, saying that an investigation into the crash had started and several arrests had been made. Uh, interestingly, one of the persons arrested is the one who filmed the scene of the missile hitting the Ukraine airplane. Uh, can you give us a sense of what your reading of this entire episode is and, and, and why someone who might have filmed the scene should be arrested by the Iranian authorities? So let's uh, start with the, per the, per the person who has recorded the movie, the film. Uh, the point is that the, in film, what we can see is that uh, there is just a dark sky and then uh, a, a missile comes and hits the plane. The, the suspicion was that why someone should uh, be filming uh, a dark sky where there is nothing and he has been expecting a, uh, an accident to happen. Uh, of course, uh, there are some other evidence coming out that uh, may, is making it sen uh, some sense. Uh, because uh, there are some reports that there have been two shots, two shots. So uh, if he has, he might have been uh, curious after the first shot, which me apparently misses the plane, and then there is a second missile. So he, there is some justification that he might have seen the first one. So he gets curious, is begins to film. And, uh, but still, there are some questions about that. New York Times confirmed the video the very first day and was very, very, let's say, fishy that uh, there is a film uh, published by someone who has just recently opened an account on Twitter and has posted it to someone who is against the Islamic Republic outside Iran. And then it goes to the New York Times and suddenly, very quickly, they actually confirm the video. Well, there is no evidence actually in the uh, media to confirm that it is the same time, same place, and the same plane. So it was okay. the first... Okay, assuming... So, 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 the, so, the sense that, sure. so the sense that I get is that the Iranian authorities uh, are sensing some kind of conspiracy here. Now, if, if my sense is correct, then obviously there's got to be someone who has filmed it would then know that a missile would be launched 
and it would hit the plane. And obviously, the missiles uh, can only be launched by the Iranian ground air defense, which is the military. So does the government think that there's someone, some elements within the military that could have been part of that conspiracy? That's the natural conclusion that uh, we can reach to. And that's the natural uh, assumption that the military needs to take into consideration. So there is one, uh, the mistake has happened, that is the clear, and they have uh, admitted that. But the point is that, is the, the uh, mistake uh, taken deliberately or completely out of human error or whatever it has been, they need to consider all the uh, possibilities. And one of them naturally is infiltration into the army. And so they need to uh, consider that and that's why several people from the person who has launched the uh, missile to up to the other people who have been uh, working at that time uh, in different places of the defense system. And uh, they are under arrest so that the investigation should be happened. I, I need to uh, also say that I haven't heard the confirmation about the arrest of the uh, film recorder yet. Uh, there have been some news, but I have heard about something denying and rejecting the news as well. So uh, if uh, considering that the person has been arrested, if correctly, uh, that is the assumption that there might be some prior knowledge about the uh, incident. And so it, he needs to be uh, investigated because there are there have been several films and none of the other people have been uh, arrested because they are filming. Uh, they have me actually filming a plane on fire. So that is something that naturally any person uh, might be recording that. Or there have been CC cams of some buildings showing the launch of the missile or downing the, the uh, explosion of the plane and different things. So that very particular film is something that seems to be actually part of the puzzle if we consider the conspiracy, conspiracy theory that might uh, be uh, okay. one of the choices. Okay, you know, it's good that you've mentioned this point because I'm also, when I said that one of the persons arrested is reportedly the person who was filming, uh, I'm also basing, your, uh, basing it on some reports. Uh, and as you said that you don't have any personal confirmation, but you have also seen those reports. But stay with me. Let me go back to Air Chief Marshal Kaleem Saadat here. Uh, here's the thing. Uh, as you said that it's kind of incomprehensive that since the plane was moving away from Tehran, that a missile was fired at it. But let's go back to February 27th. Uh, as, as I said in my opening, as the PF strike package uh, was hitting its designated targets in uh, Indian-occupied Kashmir, and then there was a confrontation in which we shot down uh, one of the Indian um, MiG-21s. The ground air defense, uh, near Srinagar, also shot down one of their own MI-17 helicopters. Now, according to uh, the, you know, the expert reports, there are a range of methods that are used to identify a friendly aircraft, uh, visual sightings, radio transmission, designated entry and exit points for friendly aircraft, and a transponder-based identification IFF system. Now, the Indian ground air defense, apparently, in the confusion, could not identify their own aircraft. And the IEF inquiry found that the, uh, the helicopter's IFF system was not switched on. Uh, how do you read into that situation in terms of procedural errors, in terms of the, the sort of hazard that it can create? unless the procedures are being followed for friendly aircraft, especially when there's an there's a aerial fight going on, uh, you know, in the same theater. Again, uh, you see, uh, what uh, the Indian story that has been built up is apparently quite logical that, you know, the IFF was not working, so the uh, ground-based defenses could not positively identify this to be a... Uh, a friendly aircraft and so they uh, fired and they shot it down. But again, one has to look at it, the flight path that it was following, the track it was making on ground. If it was coming away from uh, across our border, towards our border, 
then it would be understandable that you know uh, this couldn't be a Pakistani aeroplane. Secondly, the speed of the aeroplane is also visible on the radar scope. Uh, the way the blip moves, you can estimate whether it is a high speed aeroplane or it's a slow speed aeroplane. And it is very easy to identify. So uh, that should have been another uh, measure by which they could have determined that it is not a fighter aeroplane, which essentially they were trying to uh, take on. Uh, so uh, it is uh, most likely uh, because of the confusion at that time that prevailed because of the uh, exchanges that were taking place, the aeroplanes were being engaged, they were being shot down and all, and everybody on the Indian side at least was running helter-skelter. So in this, that confusion, it, uh, it, this situation is quite ripe for this kind of fratricide taking place. Okay, let, let me go back to the spice jet uh, confusion. Now, how do you look at that situation. I mean, I, I'm just trying to make comparisons here in terms of uh, a sort of, you know, failing deadly, so to speak, uh, which happened in the case of this Ukrainian um, airplane, also failing deadly as, as happened in the case of friendly fire uh, with the IEF MI-17. And then we see a rather cool handling of the spice jet, jet incident. And uh, you know, the PF scrambling jets, the jets uh, go there, they identify the aircraft, talk to the pilot, escort it over the Pakistani airspace. And once it's outside of the Pakistani airspace, then they turn back. Uh, is this the kind of SOP we have for this? Uh, that if there is some aerial perceived threat that the PF will go in the air and check it out or checkmate it, and we are not going to use ground air defense missiles, which if we had uh, used, then the uh, spice jet would have been history and there would have been a tragedy. Uh, well, uh, yes, that's how it is. Uh, the, the first reaction is by the uh, air defense alert aeroplanes. Uh, basically, they stay on alert to deal with such a situation uh, that uh, they will scramble to intercept or identify an unknown uh, blip on the radar. Uh, all our commercial flights, all our uh, military aeroplanes are positively identified and tracked. So if a joker appears from somewhere, uh, there would be a reaction of this kind and the aeroplanes would be scrambled. The uh, ground-based uh, defense systems are generally in peacetime, uh, not spread all over the area. They are deployed most probably at the vulnerable points and vulnerable areas, especially bases and you know uh, strategic targets, etc. So uh, they would not be uh, the first to react in case of such an incident uh, or even taking place. Uh, so it indicates or point towards uh, standardized procedures uh, that have been instituted and that have been implemented and that would be followed. So because that is done uh, and done routinely and frequently, let's say, so uh, the people have been drilled and that, and so perhaps there is no ambiguity. Uh, whereas in the Iranian case, uh, the situation was totally different. Uh, maybe the mental state of the people involved with this whole exercise was totally different. There may have been uh, cross organization uh, confusion, IRGC and you know the regular military or the regular air defense, uh, the details I don't know. But if there is a, uh, you know, uh, not a seamless integration of command responsibilities, then such an incident could take place. Okay, uh, so you're basically saying that Pakistan Air Force fighter students are all in terms of responses to likely threats. All of that is part of standard operating procedures and every pilot knows uh, what his job is. Am I correct in uh, you know, assuming that? Exactly, exactly. Okay, stay with me, sir. Let me go back to Mr. Ghulam Zadeh. Mr. Ghulam Zadeh, this has been, uh, you know, uh, obviously, as you said, that finally we'll get to know what happened when the inquiry is complete, but well, you would agree that uh, this uh, has been deeply criticized outside of Iran, what has happened, and also apparently there were lots of protests within Iran. So it kind of, you know, it's been like an own goal for Iran. Would you agree with that? Um, some sort of, yeah. 
we can say that that uh, but the situation it has been something to me it is understandable that why the mistake has happened it, it was an unfortunate event incident and nothing to defend that but anyway that is something that happened and uh, the procedure of the events uh, is in a way that I, I personally I can understand that it makes sense to me because uh, we have been in a tension with the United States but we can say that it be all began on about two weeks ago when the Americans decided to assassinate General Soleimani then they actually heightened the tension and escalated the situation and then we come to the response that we needed to actually make because if there was no response to the United States there would be further attacks from the Americans to our territory and our, and our people and then uh, we did the response and after that we needed to actually be on alert for defending the territory of Iran and defending our people so then there comes this uh, incident which was uh, based on several some some other mistakes one of them is that they didn't clear the sky of the they, they needed to actually uh, stop all the uh, civil flights uh, at that time that they expected some response from the American side the other um, fact that we know about the mistake is that there has been some alert on the, uh, the defense system that there are some cruise missiles coming toward Iran. We don't yet know that how this mistake has happened. That is one of the actually main. Yeah, parts that's of the that's story. something that Air Chief Marshal Sadat also referred to because the signature is very different. But but you know uh, it, it it definitely uh, has been a sort of black mark. Uh, on Iran, and it will also, it seems to me, I might be wrong, it's going to impact on the airliners that fly to, you know, Iran and back. Uh, apparently, the Ukrainian international airline has already stopped their flights, and some other uh, airliners have also said that they will uh, watch the situation, how it goes and where it goes before they resume flights. Is that correct? I don't think that it naturally could happen like that. It seems to be politicizing the situation and by political aims, there are some pressure on some flights to do that. From the day one, there were some, some pressures based on the reports on the media that particularly Americans and Europeans were trying to convince the flights in the region to stop their flights into Iran or over the Iranian airspace. Why we know that Iranian airspace is one of the most uh, secure airspace, uh, regardless of this mistake that has happened. It has had a very uh, good performance in, in four decades. And uh, if you remember when the other flight, the Malaysian flight was down, many flights who were going from uh, north of Iran moved to the Iranian airspace, airspace because of the security that Iran had. So there, it seems that, to me, it seems that the uh, some countries, particularly Americans, are trying to politicize an incident, a uh, tragic incident, into the for to serve their own goals, their objectives, to put pressure on Iran internationally. And so they are trying to uh, force uh, some some countries to stop their floods, as I said, into Iran or over the Iranian airspace. Okay, thank you so much. That was Hamid Raza Ghulam Zadeh speaking with us. Uh, back to Air Chief Marshal uh, Kaleem Saadat. Uh, sir, before I wrap up the segment, a general comment about, as I said in the opening, the hazards uh, for commercial flights over conflict areas. I also gave, gave the example of the Malaysian airline flight that was shot down over East Ukraine. Uh, we have, uh, you know, these conflict situations, a lot of confusion. We also have non-state actors now with uh, man pads and with lomads and you know given uh, the the you know the situation uh, in conflict areas would you agree with me that there is now an increasing risk for commercial flights uh, when they are flying over these areas well uh, tentatively yes i agree with you because uh, uh, but if you see the conflicts have been going on, Iran-Iraq war went on for such a long time. The Middle East has been tense for a very long period, but yet from the Persian Gulf hubs of Qatar, Doha, uh, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, uh, hundreds of thousands of flights take off and they 
navigate through this hazardous area, conflict areas, but uh, there have not been uh, so many incidents. This one was a, uh, and the one in Ukraine was a, a freak uh, accident. Uh, and it, it, it shouldn't really, it, it points to a gross failure and uh, like I said in the beginning, it will only be after the inquiry is done and, you know, the truth is known, then we would know uh, what actually, what disaster actually took place. I saw an interview uh, uh, from a Ukrainian official and uh, he was saying that uh, their teams had gathered the information from the side well before the Iranians uh, admitted that this had happened. And also that this gentleman who was arrested for filming, uh, they said that they had caught the wrong person. The guy who actually sent him the film, which was ultimately made public, is not the person that has been arrested. So there is a, a lot of confusion. And uh, even without uh, weapons being fired left, right and center, the airspace in that region towards heading towards Europe is so congested that uh, managing the air, uh, airspace is a big challenge and uh, the, uh, the wars or conflicts or military actions uh, in that region obviously make it more complex. Make it more complex. Thank you so much. That was Air Chief Marshal Kaleem Saad is speaking with us. We shall take a short break and return to discuss the situation in India in terms of the Modi government's Hindutva agenda what is happening in Kashmir and the rest of it, stay with us. Welcome back to Indus Special. Microsoft boss Satya Nadella has spoken out about India's controversial new citizenship law. The India-born executive says what is happening is sad. His comments came amid ongoing, sometimes violent protests against the law. The CAA has been criticized as it is seen as discriminating against Muslims. Speaking at a Microsoft event for editors in New York, Mr. Nadella said, I think what is happening is sad, primarily as sort of someone who grew up there, I think it's just bad. Meanwhile, the saffronization of India continues. Hundreds of hardline Hindus affiliated with India's ruling party rallied on Monday to protest against planned Jesus statue that will rival Rio de Janeiro's Christ the Redeemer for size. The protests in the southern state of Karnataka were led by far-right Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh with its members clutching saffron flags as around 1,000 police stood by. Analysts in India and abroad are now convinced that Modi's government is hell-bent on pushing its Hindutva agenda. Speaking at Jamia Millia on 15th January, President of Jawaharlal Nehru University's student union, Aisha Ghosh, said that the plight of Kashmir shouldn't be forgotten in this struggle. She said it all began with Kashmir, a reference to the illegal annexation of occupied Jammu and Kashmir. Meanwhile, UNSC has again discussed the situation in Jammu and Kashmir at the request of Pakistan and China, the Department of Peace Operations and the Department of Political and Peace Building Affairs briefed the council, followed by a discussion on the situation among council members. All 15 members of the council participated in the discussion. To discuss developments in India as well as in occupied and in next Kashmir, joined by Mr. Ravi Shrivastav, who is an Indian analyst, joins us from Mumbai. Thank you for being with us, Mr. Shrivastav. We are also joined by Muzamul Thakur, who is a Kashmiri activist and lives in London. Thank you to Muzamil also. Mr. Shiri Vastav, what in God's name is happening in India? I mean, what is wrong with having a statue of Christ? Uh, uh, se several shows have uh, I have done with the India's TV and I have explained that situation is absolutely grim in India. The protests are happening across the nation. And the worst part is that these protests are led by the students, young students and women. That's a, that's a unique thing happening in India this time. You will find that all protests are led by women and students across the country. Whether it is IITs, Indian Institute of Technology or Indian Institute of Management or JNU, Jamia Millia Islamia, Bharat, uh, Bharat uh, BHU. Banaras Hindu University, 
or name many uh, institutions people are out on the streets they are there are demonstrations but the best part is that other than some bjp ruled states like uttar pradesh karnataka and uh, assam no violence has taken place in other places protests are peaceful the people are on the road and there is lot of uh, i should say the unrest in the country and as you mentioned rightly uh, satya nadella has a statement that he is in, indeed he is sad about what is happening in india he is not alone there are many industrialists there are many uh, hollywood uh, the bollywood uh, stars who have come forward like deepika padukone anurag kashyap to name a few uh, plenty of uh, uh, these Uh, people have spoken against this particular law and they have joined the uh, uh, processions uh, protests wherever it is happening there is a place called uh, in delhi named shaheen bagh a uh, shaheen bagh has become a sort of a you know the center point for the educations and on 15th of january there were almost 14th of january there were almost a lakh and a half people they have blocked the road completely and all walks of uh, political spectrum the leaders are coming and addressing those who are sitting over there women are carrying their children in their lap they are sitting there the food is cooked in a community uh, canteens or community kitchens and brought and distributed over there so shaheen bagh has become a, a big mr uh, sherif you know, mr sherif astaf right mr sherif astaf capital of the country yeah mr sherif astaf uh, that is all very good in fact it's pretty impressive that there's so many uh, people out there uh, lots of them muslims by the way but also uh, those uh, hindus who uh, look at india as a secular inclusive uh, country but the fact is the way we look at it from outside that mr modi's government has an agenda it's the rss agenda and he is doubling down because he realizes that if he were to backtrack then he will not be able to push that agenda so my point is despite protests we have not seen the government buckle and it seems to me that that's not going to happen now if that is not going to happen then what exactly is the strategy of the protesters here so as as actually you are right the government is unmoved the government is not uh, succumbing to any uh, these pressure tactics and all they, they they definitely the government what do you say our government it's a prime minister of the country and the home minister of the country and the party which is ruling they are so much you know uh, so much uh, overwhelmed with the majority which they got in the last election they feel that still the majority part of the country is with them or we say the majority community is with them but one fact is there this particular education and the protest is inclusive it is not only minority community all religions whether it is hindus or uh, sikhs or christians or parsis everyone is joining the protest now as far as the strategy which you are asking is that people are building up the pressure by way of peaceful educations 13 states of india out of 29 have already said that they will not allow the particular act the caa and rc and npr to be implemented in their states so this is how the pressure is being built up the kerala government has gone against caa to supreme court there are more than 62 petitions pending before the supreme court But Mr. Shri Basta, Mr. Shri Basta, this is a Supreme Court. This is a Supreme Court that we have seen in cases, whether it was the Babri Mosque case, whether it is the petitions regarding the annexation, the illegal and unconstitutional annexation of occupied Jammu and Kashmir, which they are delaying. They are the pussy footing on that. Are you really, uh, you know? are you really serious about or you think that are you confident that the indian supreme court will actually entertain what kerala's government is saying because constitutionally it is the mandate of the center not of the state governments 
uh, as was in in uh, cooperative federalism in which is a which is a center point of any democracy the center cannot work in isolation the center has to take all states into confidence that you know on any particular act or any such thing because ultimately the implementation and the execution part rests with the particular states as far as supreme court what you have said if you hear the last two three judgments supreme court has come down on the government and said that the peaceful protests are their funda is their right they can do it and you know putting up the section 144 which is a prohibitive one for assembly of more than four people at one place is should not be done you know in uh, discriminately everywhere and that should not happen these are one or two things they have you know they have said in the right spirit as far as uh, kashmir is also concerned last week the uh, supreme court gave an order that within a week you should review the situation on internet and broadband and all those things and the broadband has already been implemented uh, i think it started in the kashmir valley since yesterday and uh, another funny thing which the government has done is they have government has planned out a chalked out in uh, a tour program for 36 of its ministers they should go on different dates to kashmir and uh, you know educate people on the benefits of article 370 over there so <laughs> much mr ravi shrivastav for speaking with us let me go to muzammil thakur muzammil so mainland india is now getting a very slight taste very slight not even a fraction of a fraction uh, of what the kashmiris have tasted not just under this government but to set the record straight even under the so called secular inclusive governments led by the congress party what's your read on that we've seen that uh, all these protests in india um th- there is no freedom freedom for the minorities and those that are rec- that are fighting against the caa and the nrc they have no respite until they recognize that the issue of kashmir is the starting point i mean this is something that we've been arguing with them for uh, yeah, at least 70 years explaining to them that the sanctity of uh uh india as a country as a sex so called secular democracy is con- completely contingent on the freedom of kashmir um so we are completely aware that whatever is happening in india is primarily based on the fact that there has always been a fascistic uh, um imperialistic background irregardless of which party has always been in power there has always been that ideology of akhand bharat of one nation one party um so we 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 recognize the issues we recognize the fact that uh, uh the people in india particularly the minorities are fighting against this uh, fascist move but at the same time they must recognize that the kashmir issue until that is resolved no other issue inside india is going to be solved either and that is extremely important to remember okay i i completely agree with you this is what i was telling uh, ravi shrivastav that they're doubling down because their agenda now if you go back to what uh, ajit dowal once said back in 2010 when he was a private citizen in relation to kashmir and pakistan the entire strategy is that you will be able to ride this out you know the ground swell you just have to wait essentially the strategy seems to be to tire out the the protesters the, to tire out the people and i think that's what they have been doing in kashmir and this is exactly what they're doing now with caa and the, that national registers of uh, register of citizens would you agree with me no you're absolutely right um they probably but the thing is it's, it's a bit of a miscalculation because the way that they've been trying to tire out the people of kashmir let's not forget that this is not since the 5th of august and even if we do take it from the 5th of august the people of kashmir have not tired out but let's go back even further and talk about how the last 70 years of the 100 years of occupation that uh, kashmir has always seen uh, the brutal kind of occupation that it's seen the people have always maintained their dignity uh, but most importantly they've always maintained the element of protesting the element of uh, Uh, um strength in the face of oppression so when it comes to the rest of india i think and i hope that they would take example they would take lead from the people of kashmir on how to uh, counteract 
the fascist and imperialistic ideologies of the BJP and the RSS. Uh, but uh, it's also worth mentioning that um, the, the student movements inside India, there is that theory that even I've started to read, um, particularly as you mentioned, Ajit Doval, the philosophies that they have, that wear them out slowly, slowly, death by a thousand cuts, and surely at some point in time that these people will give up. If the people of Kashmir have never given up on a just movement, then I don't think that the people inside India uh, that are fighting the same, the, a similar kind of just movement for their own identities and for their own um, national, national, national safeguarding of their uh, culture, their religion, and their democratic rights. I don't think a just movement can be crushed by anybody, let alone Ajit Dovu. Absolutely. One final question, Muzammal. I find it, you know, it would have been laughable if the situation weren't so tragic that Modi and his ministers think that they can educate Kashmiris, a place of high culture, high arts, high cuisine, and probably a place that has produced some of the best minds in the subcontinent, that his ministers can actually come and educate the Kashmiris. I mean, as a Kashmiri, I find that rather, uh, you know, uh, condescending and, and, you know, really pathetic. Yeah, absolutely right. I mean, it's it's ridic ridiculous that um, these are the same type of people that enforce beef lynching. They enforce the vegetarian. I mean, now even in their parliament, they're going to change the menus. Um, these are the same people that believe in mythology instead of history. Uh, their culture is basically religion. So uh, for, for such people to educate, not just the people of Kashmir or try and, to, uh, try and uh, brainwash them, but it's even the wider world. You're more than well aware of the so-called um, contingent of people that they tried to bring into Kashmir to show them the normalization. First was the, yeah. uh, um, the MEPs, and recently they had more people come into Kashmir, and nobody is buying this. So the facade that they have, intellectualism of, of uh, um, uh, wit and humor and culture, it's, it's falling flat on their face. Nobody is believing this. But the problem is, even with the doubts that the international world have on India and their so-called democracy, there is no real pressure to push them into the right way. There is no real pressure to... Uh, um, put any kind of sanction on them or bring them to the negotiating table or force them to change their values, to change their methodologies. It is, I mean, we keep on talking about how it's very similar to how Nazi Germany was run. But let's also remember that concentration camps are a reality inside Kashmir. And even in Assam, as we've, we've seen that it happened a few years ago, the NRC... Was the, genocide watch, the genocide watch has two alerts, uh, both for, I mean, on top of the list. One is Kashmir and the other is Assam. And it's, just, it's, it's a shame that the international community are allowing a new form of genocide and ethnic cleansing and demographic change and war crimes and crimes against humanity. I mean, this is unprecedented. It's just a shame that the international world, the, although human rights organizations are recognizing this, but there is no real push on the world agenda. We've seen that recently the United Nations, that they picked up the issue of Kashmir again. And this is minus Pakistan and India. So India have no opportunity to say that this is a slant or this is some kind of propaganda Pakistan is pushing. It is a closed door meeting and the, the information that is coming out slowly, slowly from those meetings is damning for India. And even if you watch the Indian media, they're claiming it as a win. I mean, these people are completely deluded. It is a nation of deluded people run by uh, a government and individuals that have a philosophy of fascism, imperialism, neocolonialism. Absolutely. Thank you so much. It's always here talking to you, Muzammal. Thank you so much for being with us. This is all for tonight from India Special. We shall see you tomorrow at the same time. Meanwhile, for latest updates, you can follow us on social media at indus.news. Good night and goodbye.